Yasminko, you created the World Childhood Museum uh, in Sarajevo in 2017. It's the world's only museum focused exclusively on childhood, thank you, affected by war. Through its platform, the museum is able to tackle trauma, both for participants, and you'll tell us how, and for visitors, ultimately contributing to building greater understanding and peace. The museum was awarded in 2018 the Council of Europe Museum Prize, one of the most prestigious awards in the museum industry. Yasminko, you're a very innovative thinker around culture and around personal pasts. Thank you for being with us this morning. What I take away from our discussions is really museums as a safe space for the self, which is clearly not the traditional definition of museums, as you were telling us, Pascal. So in a country that you, you define as still divided, yes, Minko, your country, and where memories are manipulated, your museum is an attempt at peace building by giving ownership of the past to individuals, to people who have a lived experience of the past themselves. So your business, in a way, is enabling narratives to come to life and give them, giving them the space of a museum, so a traditional institutional space, so that these narratives can be visible, shared, and celebrated. In that sense, you offer the image of a museum as a safe space. How do you build that safe space? And why did you start on this journey? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for having me. And I'm sorry uh, not to be able to join you in person as well on that beautiful stage with an amazing background. Uh, so uh, as, as, as uh, some of the colleagues mentioned previously uh, during their interventions, I really do agree and I believe that uh, museums are spaces uh, where we can discuss not only who uh, we were and where do we come from, but also who we are today and the, where we will be in the future. So the, the, the spaces where we can understand better uh, what's also in front of us and uh, where we can uh, discuss some of the pressing challenges. And uh, uh, in a country uh, where I come from, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, it's a small European country, which, as you mentioned, uh, 30 years after the war is still divided. And uh, one of these pressing challenges is how do we face the past? How do we uh, look at what happened and what, to, what do we do with it? Uh, how, do we teach the, how, how, how do we teach the new generation about the past? Uh, and uh, uh, the World Childhood Museum is, is a space uh, which has this uh, humble ambition uh, to support some of these processes, to uh, help society tackle some of these issues and challenges. And uh, uh, when, when we say the safe space, for me, uh, at least at the World Childhood Museum, we believe uh, that the safe uh, space for people who come at the museum means that they need to be uh, assured that uh, what will be presented to them is presented with integrity. What will be presented to them uh, uh, is presented, uh, the facts and truth are presented. And uh, maybe most importantly, that we not only present to people, but that we represent the people so that people feel that this museum and this space also represents them, uh, talks for them, that it is a platform where they can speak. And this is why uh, the collection of the World Childhood Museum is 100% crowdsourced from the community. So our collection is personal belongings and personal stories collected from people whose childhoods have been affected by war. And then we have the cases where these people come to the museum with, with their children, for example, if their childhoods have been affected by war 20, 30 years ago, today they have their kids and these kids start asking questions. So they bring these kids to the museum to start dialogue about part of their lives, which is not easy to talk about. And if we can create the space where they feel safe to discuss such topics with their children today or their friends or their family or their guests and visitors from other places, uh, then I think we achieved something. 
And uh, uh, in countries like Bosnia, uh, memory and the past are very often misused by politicians to inspire hate, fear, divisions. And this is another aspect of creating the safe space. Uh, can we create the spaces where memories will not be misused or politicized? I believe museums can serve as such places as well. And this is what I also hope the World Childhood Museum uh, serves uh, uh, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, represents here, but also elsewhere where we work, like in Ukraine and other, other places where we have projects today. Can you tell us a little bit more in practice how the collection works? What is it constituted of? And how did you come up with that idea? So uh, the, the collection of the War Childhood Museum uh, today uh, includes more than 5,000 personal objects and belongings uh, from people whose childhoods have been affected by different armed conflicts, uh, starting with the Second World War uh, to the contemporary conflicts happening today. Uh, these are very uh, modest personal belongings often, like toys, clothing, letters, diaries, drawings. Uh, and uh, maybe on the first look, uh, they don't carry uh, a lot of meaning with them. But they are also accompanied by oral histories, the testimonies we collect uh, from owners of the objects. And this gives objects uh, uh, additional meaning. With these stories and these testimonies, objects uh, we can say that objects grow in meaning, uh, their uh, power, uh, their ability to communicate these experiences grows. Uh, but then again, when these objects are presented next to other objects and other personal belongings and stories, maybe from different conflicts, they grow once again. And we have these new dynamics uh, because uh, if visitor is faced uh, with uh, the object of a child, uh, maybe child refugee from Ukraine today, uh, this is one thing. But if this object is presented next to the object and story from a refugee from the Second World War, then this is a new dynamic and a new context uh, for visitor. Uh, so uh, the, 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 this, 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 this act of donating the object to the museum collection is not uh, the, mere, uh, the act of a mere donation. Uh, for many people, it's a process, a process of uh, leaving part of your experience in the museum maybe distancing yourself from the part of your experience. And uh, evaluation and research showed uh, that this process can be beneficial. It can have a healing effect uh, for contributors to our collection. And this is uh, at the very heart of our museum's mission. Uh, by enabling people to tell their stories, we can empower them uh, by providing them this feeling of uh, belonging to a greater community, we can empower them. And in the end, again, uh, by presenting their stories with dignity, we can uh, empower them. Because uh, contributors to our collection, they don't tell their stories to the museum in order to inspire pity or sadness uh, from visitors. Uh, what they want is to inspire uh, respect, hope, uh, dignity, empathy. And uh, when we look at the guest book at our museum, these are really the words that come up uh, very often. And this is something I love the most about our museum. Beautiful. And that's really common with your work, Pascal, as well. You really sense within that exploration of, of suffering and of the reality, which is usually not present in museums, the potential for joy, you know, the, the space that is created to move beyond collective history for individual joy to, to be able to be present again. This notion of, of trust that you're building between collective history and, and individual narratives, I think is very powerful, yes, Minko. You speak about the, the notion of monopoly of memory, which I think is very, a very interesting concept, and about the fact that governments in unstable contexts many times claim to have this monopoly over memory. Uh, and in a way, your work really tries to undo this monopoly and open another, another currency or another language around individual memories. Can you address this, this notion of monopoly of memory? Uh, well, uh, to, to, to have that kind of monopoly can be really useful for governments uh, because uh, uh, memory and especially memory of uh, uh, difficult pasts uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, people are deeply uh, 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 sensitive to. 
And uh, this makes it also, unfortunately, a powerful tool to, uh, for manipulation and uh, to, to use this vulnerability of people. Um, if, if, we, if we look at uh, through, through the lenses of the museums and the museum industry, uh, we can see that uh, uh, usually uh, during the 20th century uh, in Europe, let's say, but also elsewhere, uh, the museums were created mostly by governments and uh, mostly with the idea uh, to show how the nation is strong, how the country is strong, how a specific ethnic group is strong, or how the army is strong. Uh, where we are moving now, and where I hope to see more museums moving, and the World Travel Museum is one of them, is the creating museums uh, which will tell us how people are strong, how individuals are strong, or in the case of our museum, how children are strong. And this is something I think has a uh, uh, much more uh, importance. And uh, I'm not saying that we don't need big museums uh, where we learn about big histories of uh, nations. Uh, but uh, these narratives are often controlled and uh, uh, they don't really bring us the human uh, side of history. Uh, this is why I really believe that each individual story is worth telling. And uh, uh, this is... Uh, how I think uh, we can most productively break this monopoly, uh, not by offering uh, an, a different narrative ourselves, but by offering a floor for people to tell their stories. Uh, uh, with the many of these individual voices and the different narratives, this is what creates one inclusive narrative, uh, which distances us from uh, monopolized memory. Mm -hmm. So you address, in a way, a shift in, in museum history uh, and a new potential for museums to uh, create or at least give space to, um, to different narratives, including individual narratives. I know that your work is moving from Sarajevo to other places. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and about the, the demand that there is for your what you know how to do, which is what you've just told us, moving from the big history to the other histories that made this big history and that we want to reconnect with. So really the individual level and the new narratives. I know you have many allies in this. Can you tell us about the resonance of your work beyond your original museum? Well, uh, after, after opening our first permanent museum in Sarajevo in 2017, very soon we started our first international projects. And this was something what was envisioned uh, from the very first concept note of the museum, which I wrote back in 2012. I wrote there that this museum should not be limited to the borders of our country, uh, because I believe uh, what we are dealing with is a, a shared experience, a universal experience shared by hundreds of millions of people, unfortunately. And my vision is, my hope is that... Uh, uh, the museum uh, one day will grow into a, a platform big enough to, collect, uh, to connect all of these communities and all of these individuals uh, affected by armed conflicts globally. And uh, uh, when, when this uh, was most clear to me was when uh, I was in Japan presenting the Japanese translation of, of my book for childhood, which the museum is based on. And uh, this is where I met people who were children during the Second World War. And they told me that after reading the book, and the book is a, actually a mosaic of short memories of 1,000 people who lived uh, during the war in Bosnia as children. And uh, people told me, uh, people in Japan told me that they could easily identify themselves with some of the memories, with many of the memories in the book. And this is then when I, when I understood uh, uh, the power of universality of this uh, topic, uh, the, the, uh, this feeling of, of sharing uh, this experience with, with broader community. And this is why I, I, I wanted the museum not to be limited to the borders of our country. Today, we are, we are having projects in more than 10 countries, and we are still a small but fast-growing uh, uh, international organization with offices in Ukraine, Netherlands, and United States. Uh, we, we really hope to build this platform, which will connect all of these communities and people. Our collection is growing every day. Uh, as we talk now, our researchers are working in different places. Our exhibition is, for example, currently um, focused on our Ukrainian collection in Bucharest in Romania, uh, also presenting the stories of Ukrainian refugees uh, based in Romania now. Uh, so this is our concept. First we go, we went to Romania to document stories of Ukrainian refugees there, and then we put this exhibition already including their stories. So this is about representing the community, not only presenting to them. And uh, we will continue our work uh, 
uh, we we are deeply convinced that uh, uh, this kind of platform can can be beneficial not only for those who experience war as children or as adults but also for those who never experienced war uh, maybe for the host communities which are receiving uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of refugees uh, by better understanding uh, why these people come what are their experiences i think also host communities can find better ways to connect with them and uh, in this way, this platform also becomes a bridge between different different communities. And this is also where, where we hope to see our contribution. What I find remarkable as well in your work is that you were talking to me about uh, an idea coming from what you call a less developed country. We talk about the global south. All of these words I'm very unsatisfied with. But an idea coming from a country that is not uh, considered a leading country, economically or politically, and spreading to more developed countries, whatever that means. I think that's very interesting because museums, as a tradition, come from uh, very strong economies and from very uh, dominant narratives, in a way. And what you're seeing is a demand from these developed countries to really take your model and adapt it. Uh, which I know comes with its own challenges. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, uh, uh, as you know, like Bosnia is a small country on the on the borders of European Union and uh, uh, often very marginal in uh, economical and political terms, as you said. Uh, what we are used to see here in uh, countries like Bosnia or even bigger countries like like Ukraine is uh, uh, organizations, NGOs, and uh, businesses coming from uh, uh, developed countries, from usually from the West, to do something here. Uh, we rarely see the other way around, and this is why it's uh, quite an uphill battle uh, to bring an organization born in uh, uh, such a, such a small country uh, to wider world. And this is uh, uh, also like a managerial uh, uh, challenge uh, because uh, I don't know to give to give one decent salary uh, in Netherlands uh, you can give like five or six or seven salaries in Bosnia. So if you want to open office in such a country for a Bosnian organization, it's 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 also a logistical challenge. It's a, a financial challenge. Uh, but uh, uh, for me, this is also about shifting the power. Uh, just like uh, just like uh, we shift the power from government to people, if we create museums where people's stories are central central to its collections and 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 the way of presentation and exhibitions, uh, we are also kind of shifting the global power. If we really have and respect institutions born uh, in developing countries or not uh, countries not really developed, and giving them also visibility on inter international stage, I believe that in this way. Uh, uh, many of the issues uh, which were mentioned before uh, I started my intervention in the intervention of other colleagues will get more visibility, but will also get uh, uh, more genuine visibility uh, because uh, the, the way they will be presented will be determined uh, by uh, these very communities that are the most affected. Uh, for example, I had, uh, I had the opportunity to visit some glass islands which were mentioned uh, in Panama. And uh, if, for example, if, if I am a European and if I would want to understand the challenges of this community, of the climate change and how it affects their lives, I would really want to see it, uh, for example, through the exhibition created by these people. So I think the fact that we uh, have the exhibitions, the museums and the platforms coming from all over the world and getting this international visibility also makes us all better and gives us all a uh, more genuine perspective. We're running out of time, but I'd love to touch on one last topic with you, which links actually to that. So to give, to give voice, to give platform, to decentralize, decolonize all of these uh, dynamics around museums, there's of course a link with the economy. And I want uh, the people here with us this morning to hear a few of your thoughts around new ways for museums to also develop revenue. You're a very entrepreneurial person. We're at Change Now. It all adds up. Um, can you give us just in one sentence your thoughts on how museums could look at uh, developing business models that are not traditional for museums? Well, one, one sentence is difficult, but I can say that uh, I hope to see more entrepreneurial approach and spirit in the museum leadership. Uh, I hope to see museums uh, trying to be more competitive, uh, maybe looking at some other successful uh, creative and cultural industries, such as the uh, film industry, uh, because uh, uh, the times behind us are the times when uh, 
people were educated, for example, to work for uh, only in museums. So you maybe did not need to com- you, you you didn't have to compete with other industries for people. But now people are educated to provide value to any industry. So we as a museum have to comp- compete with strongest industries like IT industry for people. So we need to see how we can be more competitive uh, for attention, for people, for audiences, for funding, uh, for everything. And I hope to see more of this. Uh, uh, entrepreneurial spirit in, in museum leadership, definitely. I think it's very needed. Thank you. And that's just an invitation to all of you, if you are in this reflection of thinking about business models and entrepreneurship linked to the museum culture and culture in general, I definitely encourage you to be in touch with Yasmin Ko, who is, has so much energy in this respect as well. Thank you for joining us. And I'm sorry not to have been sitting next to you, but well done on your remarkable work. Thank you. <laughs>